Welcome to Transfer to PCB, as we look at the steps required to transfer our completed design to the PCB. There are a few things to consider prior to transferring to the PCB. First, we need to add a PCB to the project. We will start with a blank PCB just to speed things up for this part of the process. To add a blank PCB, right-click on the project file in the project panel and select Add New, then PCB. Make sure to save this. Creating and shaping a PCB is covered in the PCB portion of their training. For now, we will just use the generic PCB for the project. Turning our attention back to the schematics, the first step for preparing the transfer of the design to the PCB is to ensure that all the components have footprints. Start by selecting a component and looking at the Properties window. We can expand the footprint entry if needed to look at the component's footprint model. Every integrated library component contains at least a schematic symbol and a PCB footprint. If a schematic symbol does not have a reference to a footprint, it will not be transferred to the PCB. This would be reported as an error, and it requires updating the schematic symbol so that it has a valid footprint. Looking at the Properties panel, we see a list of footprints linked to this device. With the L size version selected, looking at the footprint model, we can See the footprint in 3D or 2D by clicking on the 2D button to toggle back and forth between 2D and 3D. Normally, we would want to have all the footprint models added to the component symbol when creating it in the library. That way, every time we place a component from the library, we would have all of the footprint options built in, as it were. Looking at the capacitors on the processor interface schematic and selecting one brings up its properties. Looking in the Footprint section, we can add additional existing footprints to this particular instance by clicking on the Add button. This brings up the PCB Model dialog window. Clicking on the Browse button opens up a new window where we can select the WC Topping Library and then scroll through to find the 0805 sized footprint. Clicking OK closes the window and adds the 0805 footprint to the selected component. Now we can pick either size. Let's switch it back to the 0603 for now. Please note, again, this only adds this additional footprint to this one instance. The better method is to have it added into the footprints built into the basic symbol library. While working on singular components is nice, there's a faster way to verify all the footprints in the design using the Footprint Manager. To access the Footprint Manager, go to Tools and then select Footprint Manager. Note if the design was not compiled in this session of Altium, it will recompile before the window opens. The Footprint Manager provides a single window for checking and verifying schematic component footprints, as well as changing them. As you can see, there is a component list showing all of the components in the design. Clicking on one of the components, in this case C1, populates the two sub-windows on the right side of the Footprint Manager window. We see the footprint named and a 2D or 3D view of the, of the found footprint. With this particular instance, there are two options. The schematic symbol is currently going to use the 0603 sized footprint. If the component did not have any footprint reference, this would be blank. One important thing to do before releasing the design to start the PCB effort would be to ensure that all the footprints e exist and they can be found in Altium. So let's select all of the components on the left-hand side from the component list by clicking on the topmost and then scrolling to the bottom of the list, holding the Shift key down and clicking on the last entry. As you can see, it populates all the footprints from those components in the right side of the window. We will now select all of the list of footprints and then hit the Validate button. Once this finishes, let's scroll down and check for missing footprints. Now when you select a component, you can see its footprint, its current assignment, is indicated by the green check, and the status of the footprint, whether it was found or not. If a component's footprint can't be found, then the transfer to the PCB will not work, and in fact will probably generate a lot of errors. Selecting a number of capacitors in the listing with the same footprint, you'll notice in the middle window on the right side a series of buttons. These include Menu, Add, Remove, Edit, and the Validate button, which we'd already used. Clicking on Add from the drop-down menu, we can now edit the group of components, adding a footprint to all of them simultaneously.
Here we will navigate to and add the 0805 footprint to all three of the selected capacitors at one time. Now at this point we could change the currently active footprint from the 0603 size to the 0805 size by right clicking on the footprint and using the pull down menu option set as current. Now the three capacitors will use the 0805 footprint when transferred to the PCB. We'll reset the current selection to the 0603 and can then continue on. Now to update the schematic with these changes that we have made in the footprint manager, we will need to perform an ECO on the schematics. An ECO will be generated automatically when we click on the Accept Changes Create ECO button. This pops up the Engineering Change Order window listing all of the proposed changes. We first validate the proposed changes and then hit the Execute Changes to perform the ECO. I like selecting the Show Only Errors button to double check before closing the window. Looking again at the Footprint Manager window, one more option on the drop down menu is the Change Library one. Using this, we could point these selected components to another library for their footprint if desired. I use this approach for an RFPCB design when consulting at the request of the customer. They had created custom footprints that have been tuned for solder mask and pad dimensions. This provided better performance at their particular frequencies. In addition, we removed all the silk screen so that the devices could be more closely butted together without the silk screen to solder mask issues. This tightened the RF chain and made placement better for the PCBs. At this point, we have verified all the components. We have verified their footprints. With the project compiled and free of errors, we are ready to transfer it. To transfer the design, click on the Design pull-down menu tab, then select Update PCB Document. This will generate an ECO. If you remember the unified data model discussion from our earlier module, the compile caused by the update PCB action will generate the unified data model for the schematics and compare it to the PCB. Obviously, with a blank PCB, we'll see a lot of changes. Looking at the generated ECO, we should run a quick validate pass before executing the changes. Once we have validated, we can disable some of the ECOs by unchecking the enable boxes. Altium allows for this fine level of control. I've used that in the past design when I wanted to incrementally make updates to the PCB. Clicking on the Execute Changes button will transfer the design to the PCB, including footprints of the components and all of their connections with net labels. Note if a wire does not have a user defined net label, Altium will generate one using the component's name and PIN number, as we saw earlier in the netq1 underscore 4 net name. I generally recommend checking the Show Only Errors button after running to ensure that the ECO was completed. Closing the ECO window, we see the PCB with all of its components footprints placed off to the right of the board. At this point, PCB placement and then layout could begin. Placement and routing will be covered in a later module. Given the use of the common database in Altium, we have a seamless logical connection between the schematic components and their physical footprints. One nice feature is the ability to select components in the schematics and have them highlighted in the PCB. This works both ways and is a major help in tracking down the parts of a design or when trying to understand the interconnection of the design components. Let's split the view of the window so we can see both the PCB and a schematic. Checking to ensure that the cross select is enabled by looking under the tools drop down menu. Now let's click on a schematic component and notice the schematic component is highlighted on the PCB. This works in both directions. Selecting a component in the PCB view will highlight the component in the schematic. One other nice feature that PCB designers can use is to select a series of components, in this case from the power supply schematics, by holding the shift key down after the first selection in the schematic. This causes, of course, all of them to be highlighted in the PCB. At this point, we can now use the Component Placement feature from the Tools drop-down menu. This will allow us to place the selected components in the order they were selected on the schematic. Picking the Reposition Selected Components option. Now we can go ahead and place these one by one on the PCB. I took this approach for RF Chains to get the order and placement directly from the schematic for starting the PCB placement. Now at this point, we have successfully transferred our design to the PCB and the layout effort could begin. Before we move on in our training to the PCB side, there are a few more schematic-related features to explore.
So let's switch gears and go back to the schematic. In Altium, rules drive everything on the PCB. I like to say rules rule. But how can the schematic designer help the PCB effort from the schematics? Well, by providing additional information in the form of rules that transfer over to the PCB from the schematic. Do you remember the directives that we placed to address the errors when we had done the compile for the single net pins? Well, there are a few other directives that are very useful. Clicking on the Place drop down menu and select Directives, we see a number of options. There are the generic no ERC directives, the differential pair directives, and the parameter set directive types. The differential pair directive is used to define nets that require differential routing on the PCB. To create a differential pair in the schematic, first you must have a positive and negative net name like clock underscore p and clock underscore n. Now placing the differential pair directive on each of these nets. At this point, the tool knows these nets comprise a differential pair because they both have the same base name and an underscore p and underscore n ending. This creates a differential pair class that can be used in the PCB rules. If one of the pair is not tagged with the directive, or if their base name is different, an error would be generated from the compile indicating a missing differential pair net. Hitting the tab key before we place the differential pair directive, we can edit its properties, including giving it a name as well as adding rules in the rules selection. To illustrate adding a rule, let's employ the parameter directive, selecting it from place directive. Hitting the tab key again allows us to edit the label on the parameter directive as well as add the rule. This brings up an important concept, one that is often overlooked. The schematic should, as much as possible, be the source for design driving the PCB, not the other way around. Making changes to the logic and net connections on the PCB can cause issues and is not recommended. Always update the schematics and transfer to the PCB. This avoids documentation issues and finger pointing later on. Clicking on the Add button in the Rules section of the Properties window opens up the rule listing where we can pick the type of rule to add. Here we will add a width rule for a high current net. So every net with this directive place on it will require the wider widths that we specify with the rule. Clicking on the width constraint and hitting OK opens up the Edit PCB Rule window for width constraints. Editing it and clicking OK adds the rule to the directive. Note there's a lot of flexibility to rules, which we will cover in a future module. Now we can place the directive on the wider load net. Now we've made changes to the schematics that we want to transfer to the PCB. Let's do so using the design update ECO, just like before. Adding rule directives to the schematic provides for better flow between the schematic designer and the PCB designer. Most companies have different groups performing these two tasks. The advantage of this is that the PCB designer knows up front about differential pairs, high current nets needing increased width, or high voltage nets needing greater clearances. This again avoids the back and forth, sometimes needed in the initial transfer stage, with clear designer intents being transmitted via written rules. In the PCB, we can look at the added rules by clicking on the design and then rules to open up the PCB rules and constraints editor window, showing the width rule for the wider load net that we added in the schematics. And here we can see the result of routing with the schematics based rule for the wider trace width. In this module, we covered the final preparation for schematics for transferring to the PCB. We added rules to the schematic to better document the designer intent and verify that the needed footprints were available. We are now ready to move on to the PCB layout phase at this point. Please do the exercise transfer to the PCB.